Henry Kissinger is dead and the interwebs are overjoyed. But behind the online humor and anger, what was the disastrous legacy of this US official? The 20th COP summit has begun in the United Arab Emirates. What's to look forward to or be worried about for this meeting? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Former US Secretary of State and Diplomatic Doyen Henry Kissinger is dead. Kissinger for many was an iconic representative of the crimes of US imperialism. The direct death toll under his watch was of course in the millions even according to one estimate. But he also epitomized a foreign policy that continues to this day and which continues to take lives across the world. No wonder his legacy continues to be hailed by certain sections of the diplomatic corps or foreign policy establishments etc. We go to Anish to understand the bloody legacy of Kissinger. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Now, we had talked about in previous episodes over the months, we had talked about the death of prominent personalities who have had, to put it very politely, a problematic past. But I think the responses to Henry Kissinger's death, I have, especially online, have been at another level altogether. And I think that really kind of shows uh, the extent to which people recognize uh, his, uh, you know, his, you know, his dangerous uh, his disastrous contributions across the world. So before we go into some of those aspects, maybe I think it might be good for our viewers to sort of, uh, you know, to go through some of those, uh, you know, some, some, who he was and what he did basically, which has made him such a reviled figure. Well, yes, uh, if you look at uh, the trajectory of his career, it was pretty much uh, marked by a certain uh, support, uh, not just support, but like overwhelming uh, uh, help uh, to the American empire. Uh, if you look at uh, him becoming uh, like his career during the as the NSA or the National Security Advisor uh, under Nixon, and then later, obviously, uh, the Secretary of State under both Nixon and Ford, he was uh, one of the most pivotal figures in moving U.S. foreign policy in a manner that actually made it one of the most violent years of uh, American imperialism. Uh, we must remember that he was a uh, quite uh, important figure in actually delaying uh, Paris Peace Accords uh, while as as the NSA and there are some papers talking about how he was also uh, you know important as a prominent figure in actually delaying it before Nixon came to power uh, during uh, the election season, prompting South uh, Vietnamese government to actually delay the peace talks or even you know the conclusion of the peace talks until after the election. But uh, that aside, even if you look at his time as the NSA and obviously the se state secretary, he actually pushed uh, for the US to, uh, quote unquote, not abandon uh, South Vietnam, uh, which actually not only prolonged the war, but also expanded it uh, into the, uh, throughout the Indochina uh, region and actually, uh, you know, led to the bombing of Cambodia. Uh, also, br uh, roped in Laos into the entire war schema, and that clearly shows how that was just the tip of the iceberg of his entire foreign policy. His uh, his time uh, during uh, with Nixon, especially, was marked with certain kind of not just secrecy, uh, but also uh, the bringing the, the whittling down of the the roles and responsibility of the State Department at the cost of these two uh, running an entire uh, you know, spy network of their own, both domestically and uh, elsewhere, which was obviously uh, you know, exposed not just in the Pent uh, Pentagon Papers, but also later very clearly uh, during the Watergate scandal. So all of these clearly shows that he was somebody who, uh, you know, uh, not just, I, I wouldn't say supported, but he actually enacted a large part of American uh, foreign policy, as we know today, the kind of, uh, you know, aggressive imperialism that we had seen, the worst of it uh, was under his time in office under both Ford and Nixon presidencies. And obviously, we must remember his support for different kinds of right wing dictatorships, uh, not the least uh, in Chile, where, uh, you know, his support uh, and his attempt to actually uh, derail the Allende government and uh, it's uh, you know ascendancy to power and uh, his uh, he was he's now uh, turns out to be one of the key figures behind the murder of a general there 
uh, before the coup even happened, before even Allende became the president. And obviously, his attempt to his support for the coup that actually killed thousands uh, in the years come, uh, that followed. So he pretty much was this pivotal figure. And you obviously see that being sugarcoated uh, by such uh, terms like the detente or his attempt, a supposed attempt to uh, of, uh, to bring down the Yom Kippur War uh, through his what is what they call the shuttle diplomacy. But this is these are not really achievements. These are pretty much some level of compromises that the U.S. was forced to do at certain point because of uh, you know uh, of uh, pressures not just from within the U.S. but also around the world. So th- these are not really achievements, but that are those are being used as achievements to in all the obituaries that we usually see in the mainstream media, where he is being presented as the statesman. But obviously, as you pointed out, uh, the people are not blind to uh, the kind of damage that he has wrecked, and uh, uh, all over social media, you pretty much see that being uh, reflected. There is there is hardly any uh, word of support you see from you know be it Americans or people outside of America regarding his term and he was in power what about uh, five decades ago so the anger that comes through it and also obviously many people do not know about his time outside of government and what he did uh, during that period but nevertheless that anger that that is generated by the very word kissinger uh, clearly shows that his legacy is marked by blood and not really just being problematic uh, even however mildly you put it at this point in time Absolutely. Uh, Anish, uh, in this context, of course, uh, important one point you said which I want to sort of elaborate on a bit further is the fact that, uh, you know, at least in sections of the foreign policy establishment in the United States and some of these countries, there's been an attempt to paint him as some kind of a statesman. And a point I think a lot of people have made is the fact that, uh, you know, while uh, Kissinger has been identified very rightly so with a lot of uh, you know, a lot of the crimes of the previous century, the policy framework which he executed, which he, you know, elaborated maybe, which he executed, has not really changed even in those times. So it's not that he was an exception at all in the larger scheme of things, especially when you look at U.S. imperialism. And we're talking in the context, today in the context of the war in Gaza as well. So in that sense, really not much has changed. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy in the post-World War II period was pretty much just marked by imperialist agenda. Uh, but there was a certain brazenness uh, that was quite evident during his time in office. Uh, and that uh, pretty much continues to this day. And it has only gotten worse. It hasn't really, uh, you know, hasn't toned down at a- any level to be very honest, but it has just gotten worse to the point where we see uh, some of the worst attempts of war crimes being sugarcoated as attempts to, uh, you know, intervene for whatever human rights, democracy, whatever uh, keywords that the U.S. would want uh, for us to take up and believe in. Uh, But on the other hand, we also should talk about how this perception of him as a statesman is uh, just marked by certain ignorance of how things worked or if not ignorance, but a deliberate attempt to mask facts uh, or history altogether. Uh, Obviously, the detente and everything happened, but, uh, or, you know, the so-called opening of China, China, which is basically just U.S. establishing relations with China. But all of that did happen, but these were, as I said, pressure, uh, results of pressures being put on the U.S. government, both by the people and the anti-war movement within the United States and also people around the world and countries around the world who did not see uh, that sort of belligerence uh, as producing any results. So definitely that was just a logical step uh, as a, a manner to uh, you know save face for the U.S. empire, but didn't really, cannot be seen as achievements. On the other hand, we also must remember his uh, time outside of uh, government, where he has been one of the most influential lobbyists in uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, at not just Washington, D.C., uh, in fact, his footprints are there around the world. Uh, we forget about his role in representing Union Carbide in India, uh, where, which pretty much uh, is marked as the biggest industrial disaster, killing uh, you know thousands, tens of thousands of people in India, uh, in Bhopal uh, in 1984, and he represented a company like that because obviously he supported the company's establishment in India to begin with. 
Uh, and uh, apart from that, his uh, advocacy for the Gulf War, uh, the Iraq War, or pretty much any war that U.S. has uh, presented, and he has been there, and he has supported those wars uh, very uh, overwhelmingly. But obviously, these are uh, you know results of his lobbying uh, career that he pretty much held and the connections that he held uh, in within uh, outside of government as well. And pretty much he continued to influence U.S. foreign policy, however small or big way we might see, but he definitely continued to influence it. And his footprints are pretty much there even in the decades uh, leading up to his death right now. Uh, to the, uh, so that clearly shows that the legacy was pretty much far longer and far bigger and much of it is shrouded in secrecy, so we do, really do not know how bigger a damage he might have wrecked around the world at this point in time. Thank you so much, Anish, for the analysis, and we'll come back to you for later issues as well. The 20th Conference of Parties of COP28 has begun in the United Arab Emirates, where climate change will be discussed. Over the past few years, COP summits have become an important moment to take stock of where we are in our attempt to prevent the rapid warming of the planet. A lot of terms which were restricted to experts have become common usage. As the impact of climate change, this includes floods, droughts, heat waves and fires, are affecting millions. So what can we expect in this summit? We go to Anna Vichar for more. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, eagerly awaited conference, uh, COP, COP meets have now become something that's really part of our day-to-day -day, you know, media discussion, day-to-day -day thinking for a lot of people. So first of all, what does COP28 look like? It's being held in the UAE, which itself is a subject of a bit of controversy. But, you know, what are the broad outlines, so to speak? So, uh, yes, to begin with, you know, COP has become uh, this uh, this event where, where people expect that uh, the big climate talks are happening and that big breakthroughs uh, can happen if governments want it. But, uh, you know, many of the climate justice activists uh, who have been building up towards this COP, but also towards other climate action, have warned that uh, essentially it's uh, it's uh, decreasingly a space where this kind of uh, key decision making can be expected to happen. Uh, and in this case, of course, um, a lot of the discussion will be building upon where the previous COP, uh, the COP twenty seven, left off in Egypt. Um, and two um, two or three things uh, are probably going to jump up uh, jump out a bit uh, including you know uh, there have been widespread concerns about the future of uh, the climate target of uh, reducing or at least limiting the increase of temperature uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, which again, climate justice activists have been warning that uh, it's becoming, uh, it's, you know, it's going further and further away. We're not nowhere near reaching that target. There is no indication that things will change significantly. And sorry, uh, and many of them uh, are uh, actually concerned that uh, this specific COP might be the COP where we see uh, th that target being let go of, although it might not be explicit. So, um, you know, on the other hand, what they're saying is that uh, what uh, what we would all hope to happen, and that's uh, significant and the serious talks about phasing out fossil fuels will not happen at, uh, at this COP. Um, in short, it's probably going to be the COP where we see one of uh, the important targets being uh, being sidelined or being dismissed. Uh, on the other hand, we're not going to see any significant significant negotiation on things that could actually help improve uh, where we stand. Then there is the talk about the loss and damage fund, which is also one of the outcomes of the previous COP, which is essentially a fund that should facilitate climate response uh, for low and middle income countries. Um, this uh, this should be significant because it would allow uh, the countries which are most exposed to the to the effects of climate change to cope better. Uh, but uh, you know uh, what we have seen until now, and then again, what the warnings that have been coming out from uh, from the climate justice community uh, is that uh, first, the, so the talks about the specifics of this fund have been ongoing since the last COP for the past year, and then it uh, for um, it's still uh, not sure how the implementation will go. 
uh, will the World Bank be responsible for the for the administration of the loss of damage fund, which, uh, you know, of course, uh, low and middle income countries have already denounced as something that's uh, hardly imaginable to have this kind of international financial institution uh, being responsible for this kind uh, this kind of mechanism, or will it be something else? So th these are some of the key elements that uh, that uh, delegates at the COP will be discussing. Right, and also specifically for health activists, I believe a very significant uh, meeting as well, a moment to push a particular set of demands. Some days ago, we did discuss how climate change and health are actually, you know, very intricately connected. So from the perspective of health activists, how are they seeing uh, this summit and what are the kind of demands they're looking at? Well, again, feelings are, sh uh, feelings are a bit uh, split over this. Uh, it's an important COP because um, it's the since the last one, it's the first time that health has actually been explicitly, you know, mentioned as uh, an area which is so so intrinsically connected to climate change that it cannot be overlooked. So this this brings in um, important elements. We will have health ministries taking part at the talks during the COP. We'll have the World Health uh, Organization along with other. Uh, health organizations coordinating health actions and health days and health discussions at the COP. Uh, but again, what's you know uh, what some of the climate justice activists are saying, also the health activists, is that what we are seeing is nearly it's not nearly enough. So you know the, the ministers are going to be there. It's a very important space for them because uh, of. Um, not only of because of uh, the damage that some health systems contribute to climate change, but also because climate change is certain to impact health more and more over the next few years. But on the other hand, uh, there is no expectations, again, that there will be a serious tackling of fossil fuels and how uh, the, the whole setup of the industry and of uh, industries related to that are impacting health and are driving ill health factors in numerous ways. So um, in the next issue of the People's Health Dispatch, we have this interview with uh, with a great climate and health activist from the Netherlands uh, who labeled this as some sort of health washing. Uh, essentially that, you know, you're saying that, yes, of course, health is connected to climate change, but at the same time, you're not ready uh, to go into, into the details of that and um, explicitly state uh, how health is being undermined by, um, by, the, by the current industry. Right. Thank you so much for talking to us. Of course, a long, uh, many, many more days coming full of discussions, uh, full of some of the usual contestations around key issues of climate change and we'll keep tracking that. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And that's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. In the meanwhile, please visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.